Excited to welcome Jason Terry to the Basketball Podcast. The 19-year NBA veteran brings a wealth of experience and basketball knowledge with him to the Denver Nuggets G League affiliate, the Grand Rapids Gold. After wrapping up his prolific playing career in 2018, Terry spent the 2019-20 season as assistant general manager for the G League's Texas Legends and the 2020-21 season as an assistant coach with his alma mater, Arizona Wildcats. As an NBA player, Jason Terry appeared in 1,410 career games, the ninth most in NBA history. The sharpshooting NBA champion owns career averages of 13.4 points, 2.3 rebounds, and 3.8 assists, while connecting on 2,282 career three-pointers, the seventh most all time. Coach Terry, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. Hope all is well. Yeah, fun, fun to talk to you. And, uh, you know, why, knowing why you coach is a critically important aspect of coaching. So, Coach, after such an incredible playing career, why are you coaching? Well, for me, you know, my passion is for people and my purpose is to inspire others. And how I can do that after a long playing career is by mentoring, coaching, and teaching these young men who aspire to take their games to the next level. And, you know, the X and O's are great, but it's more about the connectivity with people, you know, motivating people to be the best versions of themselves. That's what that's what drives. me. And, you know, I always play for the win. I think that's one thing I, I instill into all my players is that, man, let's play for the win. You know, what does that mean? What does that entail? Well, playing for the win means like you trust each other. You trust the system. You trust your training. And every time you step on that floor you play to win. And so that's kind of what, what drives me. That's what's the motivating force behind my coaching career. Well, speaking on some of those, those topics uh, as a former player coaching, what did you feel coaches could have done differently or better at times during your career? Well, I've had some great coaches, hall of fame coaches, incredible uh, coaches, the way. <laughs> incredible, you know, starting with, you know, my high school coach, Ron Drayton in high school, Lou Olson, um, you know, Hall of Famer, Lon Kruger, Lenny Wilkins, Don Nelson. You're talking about some of the winningest coaches in NBA history. Avery Johnson, Rick Carlisle. I mean, Jason Kidd, Kevin McHale, like the, the names go on and on. But, you know, more than Hall of Fame coaches, they were Hall of Fame people. Like they really knew how to connect with the locker room. They really knew how to engage the guys and get them to compete and perform at a high level. And so, there's really nothing that I can say that, you know, negative or things that they could have done better. Yeah, we all could have did certain things better. But for the most part, I gained valuable knowledge and, and get valuable experience out of all those coaches that I came encounter with over the years. Well, that's great. What an incredible list. And uh, I want to go through each coach individually and get some takeaways from you before that. Maybe just give us some perspective. You were coaching in college last year and now you're coaching in the G League. What are some of the differences that maybe we might not be aware of? Uh, some, some of the biggest differences is like the amount of downtime you have in the, the pros than in, in college. You know, in college, you got your study hall, you got your, your workouts, you got your weight and strength, you got your feeding times. Like, but in the pros, it's like you got two hours, you come to practice, you get it in and then what? Like you're free to roam your day, however you see fit choose. And for me, it's like, how do you occupy your time? How do you get the most out of your day and be productive uh, when you have that type of downtime? And, you know, for our guys, we like to hold our guys accountable. Um, but, you know, it's got to be something to be said about self-accountability. Guys that are disciplined, guys that have a routine, guys that are focused in on the task at hand are the ones that usually have the, the most amount of success. And, you know, in college, everything's laid out for you. And so I think that's the biggest difference for me is, you know, just – being able to differentiate from someone setting a routine and then you having the discipline at the pro level to have your own and create your own routine. So no, knowing that coach, some of the new players say the newcomers to the G league, is that part of your process to be able to help them understand how to use some of their downtime? And then if so, what are some things that you offer in terms of advice to them? No doubt about it in the G league, it's all about development and um, you know, giving these guys a blueprint, um, you know, giving them structure, but also allowing them to have freedom within that structure to be able to make their own decisions and then be accountable for their actions. And I think for me, you know, being a former player sitting in that seat, I kind of know, like I kind of know when to push buttons. I kind of know when to pull back and to give them space. 
Uh, and I think that's been the most um, joy that I've had in this whole process is knowing that they're going somewhere that I've already been. And so when they see that and they listen to me and when I speak, I get an instant uh, amount of respect uh, when I talk. And so um, it's not like I'm always trying to teach and prove a point, but it's more like, hey, you know, everybody's journey is different. You know, I want to empower these guys to take ownership in their own individual journey, knowing that I've been somewhere they're trying to go, but not necessarily tell them, like, do it my way, do it because my way may not work for you. Right. You got to find what works for you and then master it. So, you know, that that's kind of my approach to it. And, and that's the philosophy in which I use. Great stuff. And uh, I heard a quote from you, basically what you put when you put away all the X's and O's aside, it's about managing people. So yes. and you've already mentioned that here. So what are some of the best practices you've found for managing people? Some of the best practices are, are player led practices. You know, I may give a player a, a, a the clipboard and say, hey, draw up the ATO in the next time out. You know, that was something that was real effective throughout my career. And again, it's about empowerment, you know, giving guys um, the, the, the power to take ownership of that next possession of the next play like that type of leadership um, comes from within. And when you have that, it makes it that much easier for you to coach these guys when times get adverse. Uh, because you've put them in those positions over and over again. And, you know, with those experiences, they gain valuable uh, knowledge and, and confidence as well. Is there a difference in that player led concept at, when compared to college to the pros? Is there a difference? Uh, there, there, there's a little bit of a difference, but as you know, at the pro level, see, we have a great mix. We have a great mix of rookies, um, guys that are two, three years of experience. And then we have our, our, our super experienced guys that have played at the highest level that have been in the NBA and trying to work their way back up. So in that instance, you know, those guys have kind of been there, done that. Whereas in college, you may have a, a fresh, a freshman oriented team, you know, guys that don't really have a lot of experience of playing and executing at a high level. Uh, so you got to kind of walk them through the fine details a little bit more. But one thing uh, a coach told me, and I think it was Coach um, um, Gergerich, Tim Gergerich, a uh, former coach at UNLV, longtime assistant in the NBA, is never assume anything. Like, never assume these guys know. Like, always walk them through the fine details and make sure they thoroughly understand. Because I've been in huddles and timeouts where, you know, coach draws something up or he gives instruction and the player, be, guys are nodding their head like, yeah, 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 we got it. And then we go right out there and forget you know, what was drawn up in the timeout. So never assume anything, uh, never leave anything to chance and, and always, you know, stick to the fine details of what you're trying to get accomplished. That, that's such great advice. It's, and imagining, especially for someone like yourself, who so much of this became intuitive as you played through your career, that now you have to reflect back on what were some of your struggles as a young player and what are these players going through and, and put yourself in their shoes from an empathetic standpoint, isn't it? Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, for me, it, it just didn't happen overnight. For me, it was a process. Like I had the work ethic. I had a great routine. Uh, but for me, it was one confidence in my own skill set, you know, going out there, being able to run a team and direct grown men. Like you come into the NBA at the point guard position at 23 years old and you're trying to coach and direct guys that are 30, 35 years old. Like it's just hard to do. It's like a son telling his dad what to do <laughs> like, that doesn't work out all the time not when he's been there and experienced more things than you so you know getting the respect of your teammates um you know through your hard work and your work ethic and then becoming a student of the game you know really playing the game at its purest form loving it enjoying it but then becoming a student like I didn't really become a student of the game and master my craft until I got to Dallas and Avery Johnson, who was my coach at the time, really took me under his wing. I mean, this was hours and hours of film sessions, um, teaching me how to run the team, manage the game, how to communicate, leadership skills, how to, um, you know, how to, how to communicate with my teammates. Like every guy, I couldn't communicate in the same manner. Like some guys I can get on. Some guys I had to stroke their ego. Other guys, you just needed to get them the ball and let them do their thing. So, you know, learning the game within the game, uh, it's something that I developed, you know, from Avery Johnson. And then later on in my career, um, I developed it from Jason Kidd. You know, Jason Kidd, when he came to the Dallas Mavericks at the age of, I believe it was 36, 
Um, he was well beyond his years of dominating the game physically um, with, with the high speed, the high uh, ability to pass the ball, the ability to defend. He was more out dueling people with his mind, uh, the ability to beat people on the floor with his basketball IQ. And I just sat there and soaked it all up, man. I, I asked questions. I followed him every workout session when he was, you know, working on his body, lifting weights. And he really, really taught me the game of basketball, how to see the game within the game. And it's just such, I mean, you're having fun playing the game at the highest level, but when you start to play the game within the game, you're playing a whole nother game. Like those guys are playing this game and you're playing this one over here. And it's just a joy to do. Well, it's a joy to talk to you about some of these things. And so many things come up from what you just said. Let's start first with the, you know, mentorship seems to have been important to you in your career. So I'm wondering, what are you doing as a coach to be help shape some of these mentorships for younger players? Well, what, what I try to do is, uh, for instance, I'll give you Isaiah Thomas, for example. Um, Isaiah Thomas was a perennial all-star, a guy that led the Boston Celtics to the Eastern Conference Finals. And then for three or four years due to injury, he was trying to find his way back uh, to competing at the highest level. So I gave him my opportunity. I said, Isaiah, you know what? I think you should come here to the G League, mentor and teach these young men how to be pros, but also still go out and compete and play your game at the highest level. And, uh, you know, he took me up on it. He came and played his first stint for three games. He averaged 45 a game, but it wasn't the points. It was his voice. It was the way he commanded the locker room. It was the way he mentored the younger guys. Uh, one, he led by example, but the other, he, he led by his voice. And um, it's just something to be said about a guy that has, you know, played at a high level, been an all-star. Uh, when he comes in and he talks and he speaks to these young men and, you know, he tells them, like, look, you're going to go through some adversity. Like, that's it. That's part of it. Like, you got to keep going. You got to play harder right here. You got to pick up. You got to get up on defense or listen to coach. That was one of the most impactful things I've ever heard a player tell other players in a timeout in a huddle. Like something happened. I call a timeout. Uh, I'm getting the guys ready. You know, there's two or three different conversations going on in the huddle. And Isaiah just, just steps up and says, hey, listen to coach. And in that moment, he gained all the respect, not only from the players, but from the staff in that one singular moment. And, um, you know, from there on, you know, guys, guys, it was easy for him to follow. It was easy for him to follow. Because I think some of the best leaders – were great followers. And that's no doubt something you went through through your career, that path of learning how to follow. But you mentioned already being a young point guard and then having to lead. And I know you've been in a lot of different situations as a player. So do you have any advice to point guards in terms of developing that leadership and that leadership voice? Yes, no doubt. To, to all point guards out there, you just have to understand what you're great at. Right. When you tap into what you're great at and you have to do that consistently, but you also have to be mindful that. To much given, much is required. And so when you're a leader of a team, of an organization, of a business, you know, you got to know everything. You got to know every nuance of that business, of that team. You got to know your players. You got to know what they like, know what they don't like, know what he does well, know what he doesn't do well. Um, and then you got to know yourself and trust your own skill set, too, because there's going to be a time throughout that game where you're going to have to take the game over physically and, and do certain things that, hey, everybody's not going to like you. You know, that's my last piece of advice. If you're going to be the leader of anything, um, you don't need the approval of everybody else. You just got to know how to get the job done, be a great communicator, be positive and uh, lead by example. Great stuff. And uh, moving. So the challenges of moving from playing to assistant coach to head coach. I'm curious, what were your biggest challenges? Was it X's nose, managing staff, holding players accountable? What were some of the things that were challenging for you at first? Uh, the biggest challenge for me at first was understanding that I can draw up the greatest play in America. But I can't pass it to a guy. I can't shoot it for a guy. I have to trust that if I put them in position, I have to have the ultimate confidence in them. For me, that was the, the toughest part because as a player, I always had the ball in my hand to take or make the shot. And, uh, you know, when you're not playing anymore and you're on the sidelines, you have to trust in your players that they can get the job done because you've trained them to. And, and you know, that was, that was hard at the beginning. But, you know, through a process, through experience, uh, we've gained that trust in each other. 
and uh, my guys are performing well for me. Well, you quickly learned that as the head coach or the assistant, you don't have that much control like you did as a player, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> no, you you really don't. And um, But it's, it's been a blessing, man. It's been a joy. And, you know, there's no greater joy than seeing a guy work on something in practice and then going out in the game and performing and either hitting a big shot or making that read we just watched on film. Like, it is just a great joy that I get out of it. And seeing other people succeed – that's just something that's always driven me, man. Even when I played, like, you know, though I'd love to take the game winning shot and knock it down, I was just as happy for my teammate that had that same opportunity. We can hear the joy in your voice. And uh, coach, you mentioned basketball IQ, which is something that, uh, again, you became a student of the game, you studied the game and you took that to the next level. Are there ways that you've found that you can help players develop that basketball IQ faster or easier in some way? Yeah, no doubt. First, you have to identify what is a guy's learning skill. Like, how do you learn? You know, is it verbal? Is it cerebral? Um, is it a, is it a guy where he has to be walked through every step of the way, or is it a combination combination of the two or three? Uh, once you find a guy's learning skill, um, then it makes it easier for you to communicate with him to, and to teach him and to get him to learn. Um, now, there is one key factor though. After we find out that that learning trait, um, then you know, it's the experience. They still have to go through it, you know, to get to it, so to speak. But um, again, it's something that you got to identify with. And, you know, in the NBA, it's, it's different. Like college, you, you have off-season workouts, you have preseason conditioning, and then you go into your, your preseason training, and then you got your, your, your regular season games, and then you get into league play. Well, for us, we had a week, five days, six days of training camp, then we're right in it. Like you're right in the fire. So you have to be a guy that has to be able to identify those learning traits and then get right to it um, so your guys can be in the best position to succeed. Did you find later in your playing career you had a focus on getting ready to coach, and did you do anything specific to prepare for that? No, no doubt about it, man. My, my situation and my experience is, is so unique uh, because, again, just having great mentors, you know, guys that understood, like, okay, what is your goal? Like all my coaches that I had, they asked me, what is your goal? What do you want to do after basketball? We understand you got 10 more years to play, but what is your focus for after basketball? So it was when I got to Houston and I sat with Kevin McHale and he has some of the greatest stories that you've ever heard from a player uh, to a coach. Like he, he just had just these great, wonderful instances where he was like, Jet, man, like, you know what? This next practice, you drop the plays. Like, I want you to take over the time. How you do it. I, there's something in you that I see that I know that one day you're going to become a great coach. So how can I help you in that process? It was amazing. My first year, he let me start drawing up plays in the timeout. By the end of the season, I'm in the film session. I'm running the film session. Uh, by the time we get to the playoffs and that year we go to the Western Conference Finals, he's actually allowing me to sit in on coaches' meetings. So the next year comes around and – I think it was in November or December, the University of Alabama Birmingham job came open uh, to become their head coach. And I actually had an interview for that job. And this is with no coaching experience, and I'm still playing. And this is four years before I retired. And so I had my first experience then and, you know, caught the bug. And when I got to Milwaukee, my last two years, Jason Kidd continued that development. I was in every film session. I served as one of the player development coaches. Um, as far as mentoring and teaching, he allowed me to work with Don Maker and Giannis Antetokounmpo at night. We had something we called night school. I was the teacher in this night school sessions. Um, so, you know, those experiences, man, just, just continue to fuel the fire, uh, which led me to where I am now um, as a, a sitting head coach in the G League. It's so great to hear that, Coach, all that stuff. I mean, because sometimes there's a false assumption that, that former players like yourself just get handed jobs. But clearly, again, you demonstrated that you had a vision, you put the work into it, and you're still developing to this day. And uh, I got to imagine being around the Nuggets and that organization and Michael Malone and the things that they do have ha also had an impact. Can you share some of those things? No doubt about it. And, you know, for me, coming into a new organization, um, learning the new terminology, um, learning new people that I've, I've never worked with before. It was something that, you know, I needed to learn and how to adjust and adapt uh, to. 
Um, because when you've played in the league as long as I have, you know, obviously there's certain terminology that we use on different teams that are different than what the Nuggets use. And as a G League coach, part of your responsibility is implement the Nuggets system, right? So that when the players come down and go up, there's no, there's no lag time. You know, they understand like there's a direct connection with what they're teaching there and what we're teaching in the G League. And so Michael Malone has been just phenomenal as a mentor and as a teacher. He allowed me to shadow training camp and, you know, be involved. If I wanted to jump into drills, I could. I can use my voice, um, you know. But more importantly, I was just sitting there with a notepad, jotting down all the fine details in it, which he coached. Um, not only his system, but the way he walked, the way he spoke, um, the way he commanded the room, like just being able to watch him conduct his business was valuable, valuable experience for me. That's awesome stuff. And, uh, you know, j- just to maybe two more general questions before we get into some takeaways from each coach that you've been around. But uh, I'm just curious, from all your experiences as a player and now as a coach and being around all these different coaches, what have you found the best way to correct a player is? You, you know what? And it's a fine line, right, between teaching, between encouraging, and between holding somebody accountable for their actions. And for me, each guy is different. Each guy you have to communicate with differently. Each guy you have to hold accountable differently. Uh, but the one thing that's constant is, like, my core values are my core values. There's some non-negotiables that I have that the entire team lives by. You know, and that's one, like, we're going to work hard. Like, we're going to put the work in. And uh, when you have those core values established, then it makes it easier to critique and to teach and to hold guys accountable. Um, but, you know, one guy is not the same. I think one of my coaches back in back in the day in high school was like, if I treated all y'all the same, then, like, I don't know what will happen. But, you know, you got your guys that are star players that have a little more rope than other guys. Right. Then you got your role players that you're counting on to do some of the dirty work that, hey, you know, their margin for error isn't quite the same. And, you know, I was like that as a player. You know, I was a six man for a majority of my career, but I also was a star starting player my senior year at Arizona and in high school. And I understood, you know, to coach different individuals, you had to use different methodology with each and every guy. And then with that, the ba- you mentioned this already, the part of praising a player. Is it also mm-hmm. a fine line between too much praise and then balancing that with obviously the teaching and coaching? No, no doubt about it. But I will tell you this, uh, with this generation, you know, and I played over two decades um, and there's two different type of generations of players. Uh, I just think with this generation of, of players, it's more about positive reinforcement than anything. You know, reinforce the good things these guys do. Like nobody out there is trying to make mistakes. And once you realize that as a coach, you realize that these guys, for the one mistake they make or the two mistakes they make, these guys actually have done eight or nine great things out there on the floor. And I think as coaches, sometimes you get too caught up in the moment, too caught up in this particular particular possession that you don't praise your guys for the eight or nine good things they do. And that's a lesson that I learned from Rick Carlisle in my days with the Dallas Mavericks. All right. It's time coach. We got to get into some of these coaches. I mean, it's just incredible career and incredible coaches you've been around. And you mentioned, let's start with Avery Johnson because you already mentioned those film sessions. I'm curious then what are some of the takeaways or some of the specific advice you can give to the coaches listening about how to make their film sessions more effective that you learn from being in the room with all these great coaches? Well, sometimes you have to watch the entire game in its entirety. It's easy to break down clip by clip and point out one particular thing, but there was a several courses of events that happened that led up to that one particular thing. So sometimes it's good to watch the game flow to kind of see the mindset of a player and what he was thinking. And then the biggest key, the biggest takeaway from it all is, And I got this from Jason Kidd, ask questions. Because as a coach, how do you know what they're thinking if you don't ask them what they're thinking, right? They're out there playing. They seen something. There was a thought process behind why they did what they did out there on the floor. But if you don't ask them, how would you ever know? Because they don't always think like you think. And so for me, it's it's, it's ask questions. Great stuff. How about Kevin McHale? What were some of your takeaways from playing for him? Man, Kevin McHale's thing was like, 
his biggest deal was, and he played on those Celtics teams are like, we're going to fight for every inch of this court in practice, in games. It's about habits. I will never go out in a game. This is Kevin McHale talking and let you feel like you got one up on me. So we're going to fight. If it's post position, I'm not going to let you get that spot. That's my spot. If I'm coming down and I'm in a pick and roll, I'm getting to where I want to get to. You're not going to get there first. Like for him, it was fighting for every inch on the floor. And you see the, the reason why he had the career he did as a player is because he competed, man. He competed for every inch of that court every time he stepped on the floor. And it was consistent. He, that's the other thing he taught me is that, like, whatever you do, do it consistently. Uh, then I know I can count on it. Great stuff. And you'd mentioned that competitiveness then, um, and I know you had it in your career. So how can you help shape that more for some of your, your players in the G League? Well, with my players, it's about habit, you know, creating those good uh, winning habits. And it all starts with your culture. You know, what are, what are you willing to negotiate? And again, you know, there's non-negotiables in our program. And that's when you come in, we work. Like when it's work time, it's work time. You know, we, we're going to have fun. We're going to enjoy it. But we're going to understand that we have to work. We have to put the work in to get things accomplished. And the only way we can do that is understand what you're great at. Like, whatever you're great at, I want that every day. What you're not great at, we'll work on that before and after practice. But when we step on this floor and, and the whistle is blown, we're going we're gonna to rely on our strengths every day. Well, you mentioned that night school you did with Giannis and uh... – you know, those different things. So obviously that's considered work, but it's also kind of an abstract concept, isn't it work? So I'm wondering, how do you define that for your players in terms of, is it hours? Is it effort? Where do we go in terms of defining it? So for me, when you work harder, you also have to work smarter. So you have to understand what your body needs uh, to be performing at the highest level. And where I got this from is Dirk Nowitzki. Um, Dirk wasn't a guy that would shoot or make a thousand shots in a workout. Dirk was more about efficiency. So for him, it was, where am I going to get my shots in the offense? Right. What type of defense or coverage are they going to be playing on me? And then what are the counters to that coverage? And then I will work on that repetitiously, right. To get the maximum amount of reps until I felt good to where I can go in against any team, any night, any arena, and I will make shots on whoever's guarding me. So I, I watched that, the efficiency in which he worked. For me, it was about repetition. And I needed to make a certain amount. Because when I got to that number, then I knew what the results would be, right, in the game. And I was confident that I could, you know, get that off on anybody. So each guy is different. You know, each guy is different. And you just got to find out what it is for you that makes you feel the best, right, when you step out there on the floor. So I'm curious with that too, coach, like uh, the balance for you from a player and the coach between doing a lot of those reps without a defender versus practicing against mm -hmm. a def defender, whether they're guided or they're live. I'm curious, did you have an ex perspective on which helped you more? Yeah. So for me, there was two things that helped me and Tim Gergeris uh, formulated this routine for me. An absolute legend, about, by the way. Oh, just one of the great, not only is a legendary coach, he's a legendary person, man. He's yeah. one of the greatest basketball people that you would ever meet uh just a, a wealth of knowledge but for me with 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 coach Kirk, he equated my workouts to a batting practice so he, he said he said um you know think about baseball players every day they go out and take swings right in batting practice he said so as a basketball player why wouldn't you take those same swings every day whether it was footwork right and not even taking a shot just get coming off as different actions with your footwork or getting in certain technique positions defensively, you know, making rotations defensively, right, by yourself out there on the floor? Or is it a live defender on you, guarding you different ways that the defense will guard you? So I, I had a combination of both um, that I would do, and then I would put it in a routine, uh, depending on who our, our, uh, who our opponent was that night. And then, man, it was just like batting practice. We do it every day, every single day, man. We would do it. And I remember one time Corey Brewer, um, good friend, a uh, good teammate of mine came in one day and he was looking, he was like, Jet, he's like, man, I've been watching you for 20 minutes and you're running around, but you ain't took one shot. 
I said, no, I'm just working on footwork today, young fella, just getting that footwork right. And so uh, that, that's, that's what it was all about with, with Gerg was it was just batting practice. That's awesome. Uh, how about some takeaways from Lute Olson? Man, Lute, Lute was the ultimate because, you know, for a young man getting on campus at 17 and then leaving when I was 22, I believe, um, for him, it was all about accountability. You know, hold yourself accountable. I don't want to have to call your dorm room and practices at six and you don't show up till six 30 or seven, or, or you don't have your uniform tucked in, your shoes aren't tight. Like for him, it was all about accountability. Hold yourself accountable, hold yourself to a certain standard. And then every time you stepped on the floor, you have to compete. And so for me, you know, I had a test early on in my career, because when I went to the University of Arizona as a freshman, I was a point guard coming in. I wasn't a McDonald's All-American, but Mike Bibby was a junior in high school and he was already an all, a McDonald's All-American and he had already committed to university. And so at that particular time, I had a lot of people telling me like, man, they already got a guy coming in to replace you. You're never going to play. He got to play him. And, you know, Luke called me in, my, in, in his office and he said, he said, you know what? I, I see you looked a little concerned. You ain't been yourself lately. He said, what is it? I said, well, coach, I know you got Mike Bibby coming in, man. I just don't know, man. People trying to get me to transfer. You know, what, what do you think? And he's like, listen, I don't know if Mike Bibby can play or not. I, I recruit him. Obviously, I think he's a good player. He said, but at the least, you guys are going to play together because I know what you can do and you're a heck of a player. And so that kind of confidence, that kind of trust, like it's something that I, I, I always take wholeheartedly. And that type of transparency, I think as coaches, you have to be transparent with your players. Like if you tell a guy exactly what you're expecting, exactly what's coming, then it makes it easier for those guys to go out and perform. Now, they may not like it a lot of the times, what they hear, but at least you building that trust by being transparent is something that Lute Olson was all about. So trust, transparency, and accountability are three characteristics of Lute Olson that I've always taken with me uh, throughout my career. That is such a tremendous story. Thanks, coach. I mean, transparency and reassurance that you belong are, are yeah. so important to do that every day with your players. And, uh, I, you know, part of shape, uh, shaping a philosophy, a coaching philosophy is being around different philosophies. I'm wondering, is Don Nelson the most unique of all the coaches you've been around? Yeah, you, you, you hit it right on. <laughs> you yeah. Hit it. I mean, when I tell you some of the things that we would do in practice, you would scratch your head like, what? I'd love For to instance, hear there's one there there's one play right that he draws up and it's a play where the point guard shoots the ball and intentionally misses like doesn't hit the rim he hits the backboard and he tells the center on offense to go ahead and box out his man so it's not like he's selling for a post up. He's actually boxing out before the shot is taken because we're going to intentionally miss it. If you hit the backboard correctly on the right side, it will come off and it'll be a perfect putback for your big. It was an actual play. So the play was missed shot. That's what we called it. Missed shot. I had wow. never seen nothing. This in, in my 15 years of basketball, I had never seen it before. Grade school, high school, college, my years in the pros. And it was just that type of thinking. Um, the other thing he would do offensively was he would make his guards be the screen setters on his bigs. Mm -hmm. It was something that I had never seen in my whole years because I was always taught that the bigs, you know, get their guards open. Well, he figured if we screen, first of all, guards screening on bigs, bigs don't know how to guard that type of action. Second of all, if I can get uh, my big to switch onto my guard, then I have an advantage or vice versa we get an advantage. So that type of basketball to me was just out the box thinking and something that you see now, you know, every, every game you turn it on and you'll be like, Oh, that's a Nelly right there. Um, the other thing was playing zone defense. Uh, nobody ever in the history of the NBA had played a, a three, two zone. You know, you've seen some two, three, once they changed the rules, but in a playoff series, it was my Dallas Mavericks versus his golden state warriors. And they actually played a three, two zone. And they beat us in that series. One of the most intricate things that I've ever seen a, a guy do in the heat of the moment. They had never played it all season. And in the biggest moment, the defining moment in their season, in the playoffs, 
against the number one seed, mind you. We're the number one seed, the Dallas Mavericks. Best record in the West. He played a three-two zone defense, and it was very effective. That's so fun. That's so fun. Every every story I hear about Nelly is just tremendous. So those are awesome. Yes, <laughs> How about playing for Doc Rivers? Oh man, Doc Rivers, he, he was extraordinary. You, you're talking about the ultimate players' coach. Um, a lot of teams that Doc Rivers has had has been veteran teams, right? Teams with a lot of experience, guys older in their careers, later in their careers, uh, and that's just the case with myself. Like I had won a championship in Dallas, played one more year. And then the following year, I, I ended up going to Boston to replace Ray Allen, who had left and went to the Miami Heat. Um, KG's later in his career, Paul Pierce later in his career. Uh, Rondo's still young, but, you know, the rest of our roster were older guys. And so with Doc, it was like, you walk in, hey, y'all ready? Okay, yeah. You good? You need a stretch? You need five more minutes? No, you good? Okay, you good? Okay, to throw it up. Let's go. We play for 30 minutes, get up and down, go five on no. Okay. All right. Was that enough? You need five more minutes, 10 more minutes? No? Okay, you're out of here. Go get some rest, get off your feet, get some more shots up, get a massage, whatever you need to do to be ready. And I'm looking like, and we're only in here for like 40 minutes. But he, he said, man, you know what? He sat in that seat as a player, as a veteran player. He knew that you had already put the work in all summer, all offseason. All we're doing now is just oiling the machine. You know, get your good game reps in, do what you needed to do so that your body could be ready for me to perform at 730. And just playing for a coach like that, man, when you're a veteran player, you can really appreciate the coaching style of a Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers was also a guy that liked to empower his coaches. If you look at his coaching tree and I, I speak directly to, you know, not only myself, but Tyron Lou. Um, when I was there in Boston, Tyron Lou was an aspiring assistant on the on the lower end of the bench and he would he would let T Lou run practice. He would come in and say, T Lou, what are we doing today? T Lou would have his practice plan ready, get us through the practice, and then we're off. And I just think, you know, empowering your guys around and around you, understanding that as a head coach, there's so much basketball to be had that if you empower others around you, it makes your job easier. And so man, I, I just I just learned so much from Doc um, in that experience. Well, we can we can hear it, you know, how much those stories and those experiences influenced you wanting to empower your players as well. And uh, that's tremendous to hear a little bit of where that philosophy came from. How about Lenny Wilkins? Oh, man, Lenny was a smooth operator, man. I'm telling you, <laughs> velour, sweatsuit, gold chain, like. I mean, I might have caught Lenny later in his career, but he was so mild mannered. Uh, he never you never seen him sweat like you never seen him sweat. He was always in control of the situation. He never raised the level of his voice to get you to do something out there on the floor. Um, and he had a way like you could tell he played point guard in the NBA because he had a way of communicating to get you to do something. And you didn't even know you were doing. it. He would just say, hey, hey young fella. Hey, come here for a second. Yeah, 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 coach. Hey, just slow down a little bit. Just breathe. It's all right. You, you're going to be able to get off that pick and roll and make a play. Like, just relax just a little bit. Then your next rep, you go out there and relax. And you look at him and be like, and he give you that little smile. Be like I told you, young fella, just relax. You got it. And it was just that quiet confidence of Lenny's voice, that calming presence that you miss sometimes. Now, there's times where you got to use your voice and get after it. But at that time in my career, I needed a coach like Lenny, man, because he was just so smooth uh, with his delivery. And I imagine like you didn't play for a lot of coaches that what you would call yellers and screamers, anything like that. Right. You played for a lot of coaches who were just and honest and held you accountable. No doubt. I mean, my 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 high school coach was a guy that that was a disciplinarian um he, he would get after you now and now he he held the best players more accountable than the last guy on the bench because he figured if i got on my star players then the bench guys would have to follow and so for him i mean it was about discipline now i don't, I don't think he had a uh, military background but that's how he ran his ship man it was a tight ship jerseys tucked in shoes tied um, you didn't touch a basketball for the first week. You didn't touch a basketball. It was about defense and communication and playing hard. And when you, you instill those type of 
um, skills into your players, man, you're going to have a tough playing, tough minded uh, team. And so, you know, I'm, I'm forever grateful for him because my, my toughest days were in high school as a player, like getting ready to compete for that coach. He made me the mentalist, toughest guy I could ever be as a player and as a coach. Well, you obviously value that. I'm curious about your reflections now on coaching that way in this modern era. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that still something that we should be doing to be able to coach young people, to be able to build some of those values that you learned? Uh, Again, each guy is different. Um, You get, you can't, you have to be able to adapt and adjust and tailor your coaching style around each individual guy. Certain guys just not going to respond to the yelling, to the screaming, right? Certain guys don't want to be stroked all the time. They want to be told the truth. Um, So you got to find that balance without, again, sacrificing or giving in to your non-negotiables, right? Just just having a fine line and a balance. Uh, And there's a time and place for everything. How about Rick Carlisle? Oh, man, the mad scientist. You know, I learned from Rick the preparation behind the game. Right. Rick Carlisle is the type, if you walk into his office, he would have a 10 game schedule. He will have the lineups and the rotations that he would play for each game. And then he would have the rotations for each game on that board. 10 games in. Now he can go in and adjust at any given moment, but he was always 10 games at a time and 10 game blocks. He would have his um, he would have his game plan mastered out. So I just called him a mastermind, man. And, you know, his mentality was next man up mentality. All 13 guys are going to be ready. So in any given practice, any given shoot around, the A team would go up, the B team, the C team, the D team, the E team. He would have all those teams lined up and all those teams would get and go through those reps uh, because he didn't know who he was going to use in any particular game. But he know he'd have to have each and every guy ready for any particular moment. And, man, when I tell you uh, that was very valuable, it, it, it was key because one thing about our league is, you know, when you go get deep into the NBA and there's an eight or nine man rotation, there's four or five guys that just ain't going to play on any given night. And, you know, sometimes you can go a whole month if you're in that 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th man spot where you're not going to get in. But he, he always kept those guys engaged and made them feel as if they were a part of the team. And I thought that was so valuable, so valuable because you're going to need that 13th man. If it's only for one game or for one possession, you're going to need him, and he has to be locked in and in tune uh, to what you're trying to get accomplished. What, what were some of the ways that he made them feel more engaged? Oh, that just just making sure that A got reps, B got reps, C got reps, D got reps, um, and those everyone guys mattered. were always engaged. Every, everyone mattered. Everyone mattered. And if they messed up, they had to do it again. Like, he was, he was the fine details of execution at every level. So many unique players you played with throughout your career. You mentioned Dirk, you mentioned Giannis, all these different players. I'm just curious from your perspective, who, and I'm imagining this is true, but who are some of the players that you learned the most from, from just observing them and seeing some things that they did, whether habits on the court or off the court that helped you improve as a player? I'll just say uh, three teammates. And I've had some great mentors as well along the way. I mean, Gary Payton mentored me since I was in high school. Damon Stoudemire, same thing since I was in college. Um, so I had guys that I could look up to to emulate and, and bounce different things off of. But watching Jason, Jason Kidd, how he managed people and how he managed the game. Um, again, the game within the game, how he played it what was, was phenomenal to me at the age in which he played it at. Um, and then Dirk Nowitzki. Like watching the technician that Dirk was in his routine, in his habits, and the ability to know what was coming, know how the defense was going to guard him, but to be able to put that in a routine and then to go out and execute that routine at the highest level was was just truly amazing to me. And then to watch Kevin Garnett, to watch that passion and the intensity in which he played with, in practice in which he played with in the games it didn't waver it was always on 10 a scale to one to 10 kg was on a 10 at practice in the game on the plane in the huddle in the team 
room, in the film room, in the locker room, his energy, his passion, his love for the game was always on 10. And he truly cared about people. He cared about his teammates as much as he cared about himself scoring 20 or getting 15 rebounds. He would rather see the success of his teammates. And I think, you know, he's one of the fiercest competitors that we've ever had in our game. I imagine one of the unique things that you can do is connect for your current players a lot of what they're going through, whether it's on the court, off the court, and those experiences with past experiences from players that you've played with. Is that something that you do for them to help them understand or normalize some of the things that they're going through? No doubt. I, I always, you know, reach back into my career, my bag of tricks, and I'll, I'll give out a KG story, a crazy story, or, you know, I'll give a, a crazy Rick Carlisle impression or a Avery Johnson impersonation. Like, so I'll do that from time to time. I don't want to over overwhelm them with it, but, you know, they're my experiences. It's what's molded me as a coach, and it's what helps me sometimes uh, make it relatable for them. Coach Terry, I mean, this has been amazing. I love hearing the stories, but I love hearing your insights in ter terms of coaching and playing and just so many tremendous things that you shared with us. Thank you for sharing the game with us. Oh, no doubt. Last thing I'll leave with you with, and I'll, I'll be remiss if I didn't do this, is behind every successful coach, is a, is a successful support system. Like you got to have a, a, a wife or, you know, a friend of a friend that's just close to you that inspires you, that motivates you, that keeps pushing you to be the best version of yourself. So don't ever forget that. Always keep your circle tight and have a great support system. Tremendous stuff. Thanks, coach. All right. Thank you.